Hi everybody. Welcome back. This is going to be our I'm standing by a window, that's why I'm like super bright. This is going to be our last lecture. So I'm gonna jump right in to try to get as much through as much as possible. So we left off with the avians and we're gonna go through avies and mammalia of through humans and human lineages today. And I'm just gonna scoot back over here because this is just too much light. Okay. So avies. This is the class that includes uh, birds. These are the birds. These are the most diverse of all vertebrates on land. Over 10,000 species of birds. Okay, and the big reason they're so successful is because of that special feather structure, which serves uh, a few purposes. It provides insulation, it's incredibly important for flight, and in certain species of birds, well, in quite a few, um, that coloration also is used in things like sexual selection or mate choice. So birds are very closely related to reptiles. Remember last time we talked about how birds are very similar to the crocodilians. They're both uh, phylogenetically right next door, neighbors, right? So birds still have many reptilian traits, and I'm gonna show you a, a phylogeny in a minute showing you which reptiles birds are most related to in terms of being extinct, like their ancestry. But two of the main traits that birds have um, that were from their reptilian ancestors are amniotic eggs and scales on their legs. Also remember though that reptiles, prehistoric reptiles, um, well dinosaurs I guess I should say, you know they exhibited nest building and parental care which is something that is also conserved in avians. So major distinguishing traits of birds. First of course is that feather. That is the structure that is most responsible for the um, success of this class. So feathers are simply made of keratin, which is a protein. That's what your hair is made of. So there are modified scales of keratin that provide primarily, like I said, insulation and are critical for flight, which is like the hallmark of this class. So feathers are that first distinguishing trait, and the second is their thin and hollow skeleton. So they have what we call a flight skeleton, which means that their bones are really light. They have hollow bones, and they're fused. So if you were looking at a skeleton and you were trying to figure out what that animal was, if you saw, like, say you're looking at a collarbone and it's fused, Right. If, if you see a lot of fusion of bones in a skeleton, that's a clue that you're looking at a bird, an avian, because they have thin hollow skeleton and it's fused so that they can anch it anchors those really strong flight muscles. Another um, characteristic of a bird skeleton is it's called a keeled breastbone. It's actually called a keel. Um, so this is a place for their flight muscles to attach. And so uh, it's essentially an extension of the sternum. So you have a sternum right here, right? That is basically your breastbone that your ribs radiate from. And in a bird, if you ever were to dissect a bird, um, which I would love to teach, we don't, I don't dissect birds here, but I taught bird dissection before. It's really interesting because to get to the internal organs, you have to get past the flight muscles and the flight muscles are attached to that keel, which is that long extension of the sternum and so you have to bring your hands up under that keel and rip it back to get to the organs. It's pretty pretty crazy actually um, and it's hard to do. <laughs> anyway so that is a big hallmark of, of these animals is that thin hollow skeleton that is fused with that keeled sternum. So let's talk a little bit about the history of birds. Remember from earlier this semester we talked about fossils and how we know that evolution is really what's happening. Um, so recall the Archaeopteryx I mentioned before it was the first bird um, and we have fossils so we've been able to kind of reconstruct 
what Archaeopteryx looks like, and Archaeopteryx was one of those intermediate forms that had some reptilian characteristics, such as a toothed beak or a long tail with vertebrae in it. But it also had some characteristics of modern birds, such as feathers, which you can actually see in the fossil itself. Those were fossilized. So feathers, um, three-toed feet with one, well, three-toed feet with one going forward and one backward. Though that is, that trait is actually descended from the dinosaurs. I'll show you that in a minute. But it is one characteristic of modern birds. So most paleontologists would tell you that birds are descended from theropod dinosaurs. Theropod dinosaurs, you're going to love this, velociraptors. Velociraptors. Oh, yes. Some of you may already know that. The birds are phylogenetically descended from, um, yeah, velociraptors and a few other forms. So, uh, and then you have Archaeopteryx, which was that proto bird. My dog is crying now. Okay. Um, yes. So, Archaeopteryx being that first bird that we have evidence of, but you have have certain characteristics that were present in these theropod dinosaurs that are clearly part of the bird lineage. Um, for example, so velociraptors have like, they had a swelling wrist bone. Birds have that, and it's actually absolutely necessary for flight in birds. So that's one clue that the velociraptor is um, an ancestor of modern birds. So if you're afraid of birds, I mean, Maybe it's a dinosaur thing. Okay, so modern birds. Let's so that's bird history. Just remember, Archaeopteryx was one of those um, primitive birds, the first bird that we have evidence of. But they're descended from theropod dinosaurs, which include the Velociraptor. Okay, so um, in modern birds, you can tell a lot about a bird by its beaks and its feet. It gives you information basically about what it eats and kind of how it eats. Um, but lots of information about their food or feeding niche. For example, in owls, you have these curved talons and they've got really sharp beaks. So you can guess that they're tearing things apart with that, right? Casual. Uh, ducks have their flat beaks and for shoveling through like muck or mud, like in a wetland, um, or picking up insects. Y'all hear my, my dog crying? She's distressed because my son is outside. Exactly. Anyway, uh, and finches, you have uh, short, thick beads, be beaks uh, for crushing seeds. But you'll recall, you know, seeds versus insects. When we talked about finches, you could you had that adaptive radiation and that adaptation of the um, phenotype to right what you're eating. So you can tell a lot about an organism, particularly birds, based on those characteristics, their beaks and their feet. So let's talk about how birds are adapted for flight. Okay, the big, well, these are all big things, I guess, but one big thing is they have these ancillary air sacs. So if you were to open up a bird, you would find not only lungs, but you'd have anterior and posterior air sacs. And what that does is it allows for super efficient one-way movement of air. So, what you know, in your lungs, you take in air and then it's expelled right so you have bi-directional movement of air in your lungs right it goes this way and then it goes out right in a bird they take in that air all right and it moves one way through the lungs it goes so it's basically you can constantly cycle air like this so it allows for <coughs> well you can take in a lot more oxygen this way, which is really important for oxygenating and providing energy uh, to the flight muscles. So that's a big thing. If like, if I wish I could dissect a bird with you because you can actually see those air sacs um, that allow that unidirectional movement of air through the lungs, which is a huge, a hallmark of birds. They also have, um, so we talked about crocodilians having the four-chambered heart. Birds have a four-chambered heart, obviously, and that, so that allows for optimized circulation and oxygenation of the tissues. They also have very fast heartbeats among the fastest, I think, uh, hummingbirds? I think 
have the fastest heartbeat of you have the fastest heartbeat because you have to have really efficient circulation and respiration so that you can oxygenate and provide energy to the flight muscles because flight is an incredibly energy intensive process okay another adaptation for flight is endothermy that High body temperature allows for higher metabolic rate, higher rate of ATP production, higher rate of energy production that supplies energy for flight. Okay, so those three things, efficient respiration through those ancillary air sacs, efficient circulation with the four chambered heart, really fast heartbeats, and endothermy, that, that high body temperature that allows for high metabolic rate and thus more energy production. Okay, and birds actually run a little warmer than we do. We run at, I think, about 37 degrees C. They run at like 40, so, oh, it's right there, 40 to 42. Like 40, yeah. So they run actually a little hotter than we do because they need all that energy for flight. Okay, so the rest of this, these slides, do look through them. I'm only going to spend a minute just to tell you about the Pesseriformes. So class A, B's, and then you get the order level. You have all these different orders of birds. The most common, the most abundant order are the uh, Passeriformes, who are basically all the birds you've probably seen. This it includes the corvids, which are crows and mock or crows and blue jays and those guys. Um, songbirds. Yeah, those are songbirds. Most of the birds that you're familiar with are in the Passeriformes order. And that is the most widespread and um, abundant order. I think the most diverse order as well. Yes, that's right. It's the most diverse order as well. So lots of these birds within this order. Okay. Now I'm not going to go through every single one of these, but you can look through and see their various characteristics. Please do, because some of these birds you've probably never heard of before, like an auk. I don't know. Some of you may have heard of an auk, but maybe not. So <clears throat> it's important for you to to see some of these organisms. Oh, columniformes are the piggies. Okay, sorry. The falconiformes, which are your birds of prey, right? So eating the carnivorous bird, they're all carnivorous birds. Galliformes, okay, now I'm going through them a little bit, but it's because I love them. Galliformes, which are your chickies, okay? Chickens, quails, um, we eat a lot of these. Some people eat a lot of these. Yeah. Uh, formies, which are your marsh birds, beautiful cranes and rails. Rails are super cool. I have a friend who whole PhD was about rails. They're super secretive. And oh, you should look at this paper. She discovered that they swim. That was like she discovered it. She was like, oh wow, nobody's ever seen a rail swim before. They freaking swim. Okay. Um, other waterfowl, like the ducks in the eastern ponds or Anseriformes. Owls, I mean, just go off. Okay. Sorry, I can't stop. I love looking at them. Okay, okay, okay. Kiwis, which are only found in New Zealand. Okay, okay, okay. So look through all those. You don't have to memorize. So don't you don't have to memorize the order names. I really told you about Passeriformes because um, that is the most abundant and diverse of the birds. Um, and I'm not going to ask you order names. I'm not going to do that. But I want you to see this. Don't just look at the birds, okay? Just learn about them. Okay. But let's move on to mammals because I'm finished. Look, this is your last lecture. I, if I don't finish today, well, then I don't finish. No, I will. So let's talk about now we just got through ABs. So let's talk about class mammalia. I'm getting my thin red from mammalia. Okay. So. There are about 5,000 species of mammal, um, which is we are, there are fewer of us than the other vertebrate classes. We're actually, there are not a ton of mammal species, honestly. And most of them are very small mammals, like um, rats, rodents of all flavors, um, bats, which are like flying rodents essentially, but they're not really rodentia, so. Okay. So let's talk about what makes a mammal a mammal. Fundamental mammalian traits. This is the key in all of these. What I'm teaching you is to ask yourself, like amphibians, reptiles, birds, what are the key features? You just want to be sure you know those, okay? So 
Fundamental mammalian traits. We talked about this in lab. Hair. You have hair, right? So here, made of keratin, which provides all sorts, it has, serves a few functions. So insulation, it's actually part of the reason that uh, mammals may have survived that mass extinction event, is our fur and hair. It also provides a, a crypsis or camouflage in certain environments. Um, some animals use them as a sensory structure, um, all sorts of things. What do you use your hair for? I mean, I guess ours is like ornamental nowadays, but it does serve a function. It actually does keep your head warm. So, um, all you have, you have hair and fur, even on mammals that you don't really realize you have hair and fur on. I mean, I know you know you have hair and fur. You don't. Do you know you have hair all over your body? You basically do. Oh, yep, there it is. Women in my family, we start to grow long hair on our chin at some point. Uh oh. Okay. Anyway, so dolphins. Hopefully you know, but if not, you're learning today. Dolphins are not fish. They're mammals. I know, it's so adorable. They have hair and fur just like us. Um, in fact, they use it as a sensory structure. Along their beaks. Okay, so that's the first thing, hair and fur. The second is mammary glands. Not grabbing my chest, I almost did. Sorry. So uh, females or uh, possess mammary glands for milk for young. So that is a hallmark of mammals. We can nurse our young. Right, Rebel? My son's over there. He's like... <laughs> okay. Endothermy, being warm-blooded. Now, being warm-blooded is a hallmark of a few of our um, corvate classes, right? Being warm-blooded, endothermy, um, hallmark of birth allows for their flight, right? But endothermy allows for our higher metabolic rate as well. And we have, now this is something to remember, this is similar to the avians. We have a four-chambered heart. I hope you know that. You have a four-chambered heart. And we respire with our diaphragm, okay? It's that thoracic breathing. Also, here are some cute mammals for you. Also, most mammals, not all, but most, have a placenta. Is I'm doing everything in my power not to go get my placenta right now. It's right there. It's over there. It's in my freezer. I'm going to do something with it. Maybe, oh, that's a good quarantine project, right? Hey, uh, yeah. Maybe I'll put that on the biology. No, would I get fired for that? I have the placenta. It's biology. Look, man. I was planning to do something with it, and it didn't work out, okay? The lady who was supposed to encapsulate it couldn't because she was busy, and I keep waiting for us to live somewhere where I can, like, bury it and put a little tree over it. It's cute and poetic. So, uh, and we rent, we're renting our house right now, so it's like, mm. so anyway, anyway, placentas, placentas, right, right, right. Awesome. Um, these, oh, man, placentas are so cool. They are specialized organ that bring fetal and maternal blood into close contact. And it serves a few functions, um, you know, uh, exc excretion of wastes, um, basically providing for that, that, fun that embryo and eventually fetus, you know, provides it with um, hydration, with nutrients and food, oxygen, all of those things. It's like the, it's the workhorse in gestation. Oh man, I'm going to say that again. It's the workhorse in gestation. Sorry, you see, this is what happens when, you're, uh, when your professor's a bird coach, because I'm like, placentas are the coolest. Every time I have plants, you know, I'm like, and okay, so let's, let's, make, let's make a plan. What you want to do with that placenta? And they're like, well, like, what? And I'm like, do you want to take it home? I mean, you could like make some art with it, and then like, you could bury it or you could have it encapsulated. Limited evidence of those, those uh, benefits, do be aware. So you may not want to, but some people are really into it. Um, so again, not a lot of papers out about the, the, um, the, there's a lot of anecdotal evidence about the benefits of, and when I say encapsulate, what happens is they, I'm spending too much time on this, right? 
They dry the placenta out, they grind it up, they put it into pills, and postpartum women take it. And there's and a lot of people anecdotally say it really helps them with their hormones, with their um, you know, there's a lot of tenuous emotions in postpartum. A lot of folks say that it's like a lifesaver. Um, again, limited evidence in the peer reviewed literature, but I haven't checked in a, in a year or so. So um, anyway, placentas, hallmark of mammals. Super cool. Okay. Not going to give up placenta. Yes. And you can see here, so that placenta, and the placenta is actually made from, um, it's like chorion and allantois tissue that make up the placenta, but you actually do still have, you have the chorion, all right, just as you do in the amniotic eggs, right? You have um, the amnion here, which is that fluid that's that we think of as the water that breaks. So that's encasing that fetus there. You have, you do have a small yolk sac. And here's the thing, the allantois, so part of allantois tissue and chorionic tissue um, becomes the placenta, but the umbilical cord is allantois tissue. Okay, so if you're wondering where that is, that's where it is, because I know you were wondering. Because remember, you have those four port parts, right? Chorion, the allantois, the yolk, right? And the amnion. Okay. Cool. So, let's talk about other adaptations of mammals. That's fun. Yes. So, um, you have specialized teeth that are related to feeding niche or feeding mode. So in carnivorous animals, you have those carcanes, right? Whereas in herbivores, you have more grinding teeth. You don't have uh, canines. So that's an important thing to remember. That's a, that's a really cool adaptation and specialization, which you'll find in the mammals. So here you see, here's a canid. You can see they've got grinding teeth, ripping teeth, and chiseling teeth, right? So in canids, you have very prominent chiseling and ripping teeth, right? Only a few of those grinding teeth back here. Whereas in herbivorous animals like deer or elephant um, and beavers, but they have that chiseling teeth to get through um, bark of trees. But here you can see clearly that matches the feeding niche, which is eating wreckage, right, greenery. Um, in humans, we have, primarily, we have mostly um, grinding teeth, but we do have ripping and chiseling teeth that are just a little more reduced than some of the other um, carnivores in our class, but we do have those teeth. So, um, and they were, you know, we have these ripping teeth because part of the reason that we think that humans have evolved such big brains is because Humans historically um, started eating meat, right? Fatty meat that provided fat for the growth of that brain tissue. Okay, another adaptation is the ability to digest plants because many organisms, um, plants are hard to digest. Cellulose is difficult to break down. So most of the herbivorous animals um, who are mammals, most herbivorous mammals have, uh, or at least many of them have, some sort of part mutualistic association with, for example, we talked about the archaeobacteria, right? Ruminants, ruminant animals have large vats of various stomach compartments that are that have bacteria in there to help them break down plant matter, right? So digestion of plants and those mutualistic partnerships with bacteria to help break down that plant matter, that is a is an egg. Extra adaptation in the mammals. Development of hoops and horns and other hoops are simply basically the pads of keratin. Yeah, like big old fingernails. Thick, very thick. Okay, that is a hallmark and adaptation in mammals, as well as um, so those are your hooves and your horns. Oh, fun fact, did I tell you this? Yes. So horns are actually the the middle is bone, but they're surrounded by keratin. Antlers are all just bone, FYI, um, not keratin. And fun fact, you know, antlers grow from the tips, just so you know, and hooves grow from the bottom. Okay. 
Another adaptation. In bats. Freaking bats. Fly. Freaking bats. So bats can fly. I don't know if you noticed. They can. And these are the only mammals that are capable of flying. I'm not gonna make a joke. I'm not gonna do it. Okay. So Basically, their wings, we looked at this when we were talking about homologous structures, right? Bat wings have basically thin skin over their finger bones. Well, actually, they're four finger bones, but yeah. And they are able to navigate their world using echolocation. And um, we talk a lot more about bats and animal behavior if you're interested in that. Freaking bats! Okay. So those are adaptations of mammals. Um, be sure you know those main four, but those secondary adaptations are also um, have been helpful in the success of the mammalian class. Okay, cool. So let's talk about the two subclasses of mammals, the Prototheria, which are our most primitive mammals. These are the egg-laying mammals. And there's only three species of these that are alive today. Um, and so the Prototheria, there used to be more of these egg-laying mammals, but nowadays we only have the monotremes. So the monotremes are the egg-laying mammals. That includes the duck-billed platypus. I feel wrong. Sorry. And, he gives some eggs. And an echidna. There are two species of echidna. So these are monotremes. They're egg-laying mammals okay they don't have well-developed nipples they do still have mammary glands but they're not really well-developed nipples um and they have a cloaca eh, like reptiles so the cloaca is basically an opening it's like a it's a walmart of orifices i hate that i have said that walmart i don't know some terrible big box store that has everything that's what a cloaca is for orifices Yeah, so cloacas are where like you you um, have feces, urine, eggs, you, you name it, cloacas do it. Okay, um, you don't have a cloaca. Nobody watching this has a cloaca. I mean, no, you wouldn't. Okay, so um, anyway, prototheria, those are the monotremes, egg laying mammals, duck billed platypus, and echidna. All right, and you have the theria. Theria um, are us. They are the viviparous mammals. Viviparous means that we have live young. We don't lay eggs that I know of. If you lay eggs, call me. Okay, so because I want us to get famous. So we have two groups in the Theria. And I, you know, I, I mainly just want you to know the divisions, you know. So like you have monotremes, and then you have the viviparous mammalian, mammalian folks who are the marsupials and the placental mammals. Okay, so marsupials are the pouched mammals, like kangaroos, or my personal favorite, the possum, and placental mammals. So let's talk about marsupials. Ooh, did I already show you guys? I may have shown you my painting. I'll show you in a minute. Is it, is it a painting? Anyway, so the marsupials, oh, Lord have mercy. These organisms, they, um, they bird their young very early, and then what will happen is the young um, will crawl up into the pouch and attach to the, ma the mammary gland, well, the nipple, inside the pouch to complete its development inside the mother. Let me move this this way. Here we go. And that feeds into the main differences between the marsupials and the placental mammals are embryonic development. So basically, Oh, I already told you that. So they're, they have a placenta, but it doesn't last long. It's very short lived, which is why they have to like, they're born very early. So they crawl into the pouch and continue to develop. You have a few species of kangaroo that you find in Australia. And then you have the opossum. Here, I may, I may show you guys this, but you know what, I'm gonna do it here. You know what, let me just make this display. Oh my gosh, there's water on my computer. Oh, not that. That's not what I want. Okay, are you ready? This is my living room. Oh, I'm totally wasting time. I'm sorry, but I had to show you. My living room. 
and this is Jesus and the twelve opossums. One of my bridesmaids gave me this for our wedding because she knows I love opossums. Capybaras and opossums, my favorites. Do you see the opossums? Okay, so those are marsupials. Very, they, so they differ from the placenta in their embryonic development. Short-lived placenta, pouchy time. All right, that's how you'll remember it. And now you'll remember it because I showed you Jesus and the 12 opossums. Okay, hopefully that'll help you remember. Ooh, that was funny. Okay, so let's go back. Watch this. Uh, okay, so hopefully this gets picked up by TV because I definitely want to teach everybody biology and show everyone Jesus and the table possums. Okay, so let's go back. Yeah, those are the those are the marsupials. Okay, those are marsupials: kangaroos, wallabies, opossums, marsupials. If you don't know what a wallaby is, look it up because it's already been thirty minutes, so we gotta go. Okay. Oh no, I'm gonna have to plug in the phone Is it for my computer. It's okay. So, until mammals. We have a placenta. I know you're surprised. Yes. So this placenta um, is, I told you, you know, it's it's coron and allantois together. It's, and it's a combination of fetal and maternal tissues. Okay. And as you may know, um, placental mammals develop a lot. They have pretty long gestation periods compared to the rest of the animal kingdom. I'm going to get out of there. There we go. Very long gestational periods compared to the rest of the animal kingdom. Um, I can personally... trying to fix this window. There we go. I can personally vouch for the fact that uh, placental mammals are pregnant forever. It's forever. Okay. And most mammals are placental mammals, such as this adorable feline and this adorable dolphin, placental mammals. <clears throat> so, your book has a beautiful table. And it, so, I, you know, we went through the orders of birds, sort of. That, that is a table in your book. So, please look through that. So, I just want you to get an appreciation for the diversity of the different kinds of birds and mammals. You know, we don't have a ton of time to go through these. Um, I do want you to know, like, what a mammal is, right? So it includes rodents, mm, love rodents, right? Beavers, porcupines, rats, love. Um, the paraptera, I won't tell you all the orders, but bats, right, bats, the only flying mammal. Bats, okay? Balls and shrews, bears, cats, raccoons, weasels, doggies, all the carnivora, so these are all predatory, and these all separate out into different families, of course, like bears, or bears, cats, dogs, they're all part of order carnivora, but they separate out into different families, obviously. Primates, which includes humans, we are mammals, hope you've heard that. Uh, who else? All these dudes, look at all these dudes, check them out, right? So elephants, horses, armadillos, sloths, Rabbits, pikas, dolphins, whales, oh, they're right there, whales, deer, giraffes, most of the animals that people are like, I love this animal, it's, there are a lot, a lot of them are mammals. Okay, so, there you go. Um, let's see, and I do have a, a look over here at their key characteristics, though, just because um, some of them have very interesting, like, you know, bats fly. Whales and dolphins are marine. Wow. <laughs> right? Okay. So now we're going to talk about, we're going to get real, like, your book kind of funnels out, right? And it's like, okay, now we're talking about animals. Yeah, now we're talking about mammals. Now we're talking about primates. And now we're going to talk about humans. So um, we are a member, of, we are members of order, the primate order, primates. Um, so, you should know that. And we have two key features that were instrumental in our success. The first is our adorableness. No, I'm just kidding. That's, no. Don't. Mess with me. Come on. <laughs> right? Which allows us to play video games. 
Um, so those those grasping digits, yep, those little thumbs were incredibly instrumental in our success because we're able to grasp, we grasp food, we climb, big leg up there evolutionarily. Okay, and the second is binocular vision. Binocular vision, what that means is that rather than having eyes over here, you have eyes over here. And that makes your visual acuity higher and it also helps your brain to depth perception and distances are judged much more accurately when you have binocular vision. Okay, cool. Um, we are also highly adapted, and I say we because we're members of primates, uh, to arboreal environments, which means basically forested environments. And, uh, you know, there was a time when much of the world was basically rainforest, but forests cover a large part of portion of the world still. And that adaptation to the arboreal environment was very helpful. Also, our hair and fur was a huge thing because, and I mentioned this before, when uh, when there was that asteroid impact 65 million years ago that killed off most of life on our planet, mammals persisted, it's thought, because they had fur. So they didn't, like, they weren't super coldy, right? They had fur um, and endothermy. So, those were some of the ways that mammals um, and primates persisted. But one of the one of the big thing in primates was that adaptation of the arboreal environment, trees, forested environments. So you have a couple of um, a couple of lines of primates. Procinians are a defunct lineage, but your book mentions them. Procinians used to include it's a paraphyletic group that has since been basically separated out includes lemurs, lorises, tarsiers, and we've actually found that these organisms that were the prosimians, we could fit into different classifications of, you know, new and old world monkeys. And um, so just know that this is a paraphyletic group. This is kind of a defunct lineage, but so some of them are more actually related to apes than to the others. But I, your book mentions it, so I'm going to mention it. Most of these are nocturnal, um, have very large eyes. So, like, if you've ever watched, you know King Julian? My son loves King Julian. Anyway, okay. I love the one where he gets on coffee. That's so funny. I relate. Okay, so now let's talk about anthropoids. This includes um, the, the apes. Actually, here. I think I have them all. Here we go. It includes New World monkeys, Old World monkeys, apes, and humans. Okay, anthropoids. And just so you know, the anthropoid is essentially like an infra order classification. It's not like, it's just a grouping, okay? It's not like a, a different taxonomic classification. It's just a whole bunch of organisms in this order. So most anthropoids are diurnal, which means we sleep at night and we wake up during the day. Um, and one of the big innovations that allowed for foraging in the arboreal environment was color vision. Color vision is incredibly helpful. Not everybody has color vision, even in humans. That's fine. That's cool. Hey, man, no problem. At least you can see if I would be dead. I'm super blind. So dead. Anyway, we also have an expanded, expanded brain in the anthropoids. And we exhibit complex social interactions that include very long, very long, very long parental care. The longest parental care. So long. And a long period of learning and brain development. Or it's calling me out. Okay. So those are some of the hallmarks of the anthropoid, which you can just think of like humans, but also new world new world monkeys, old world monkeys, and apes. Also. So um, just a little bit about the evolution of primates. So 30 million years ago, there's evidence that New World monkeys migrated to South America. Uh, these are all arboreal, and many have most of them actually. That's one of the ways that um, a lot of folks identify pre New World monkeys. I mean, obviously where they live, but um, which New World monkeys are. In the Americas, right? So you'll find in like South America, 
They have prehensile tails, which means they have tails that they can like. And then you have old world monkeys. He's mad because he doesn't have a prehensile tail. Sorry, bud. They remained in Africa along with the hominids. And the hominids, hominoids, hominids, um, they're like hominidae. Hominoids are just a grouping of that. Okay. Those are the great apes and humans. The ape is very great. It looks kind of mad though. Okay. So hominoids. Now we're kind of funneling down. The hominoids include apes and hominids. So like family D, which were the homo, uh, it must have been homo genera, but not all. Um, there were like other hominids, like Australopithecus. Anyway, so hominoids include the apes. Um, these, the great apes have larger brains than monkeys. Sorry, monkeys, I mean, that's just how it is. Um, and lack tails, right? And they're actually a paraphyletic group. Some of the apes are more closely related to hominids for example, the orangutan, right? Um, well, they're actually members of family hominidae. So anyway, um, but the hominoids, some of them are more closely related to hominids and humans than actually to other apes and further on monkeys. Um, and then you have the hominids, which are humans and also include other, actually other apes like chimp, gorilla. But the gibbon is a kind of an out group here. And one kind of cool thing. So many of you have probably heard chimpanzees are our closest non-human relatives in the animal kingdom, which is absolutely true. Um, we are so genetically similar to chimpanzees. It's almost like we have almost the same genetic similarity as you would see at the level of a genus. That's really, I mean, there's actually a lot of diversity in genera. So, but that's still really genetically similar, which is a clue of our um, common ancestry. Really cool. Um, and we think that that common ancestor was an arboreal or a tree climber, a forest um, climber. And then you have this divergence where apes continued and they evolved to walk on their knuckles. And they have a lot of changes in morphology that have to go with that, such as this really straight back, which we'll talk about in a minute. Whereas we evolved to be upright walking and bipedal, which um, we'll talk about some of those differences in morphology in just a second. But I will say, you know, it's kind of interesting because um, bipedalism has some advantages, but actually a lot of disadvantages. <laughs> um, there, are, as you age, bipedalism ends up kind of messing with you. So um, the differences in how we have diverged based on this. So in the apes versus the humans and like human well, hominids, human like hominids, um, you have that straight spine in the apes, whereas we have curvature in our spine, right? You have where the spinal cord exits is actually different. So in humans, your spinal cord exits at the base of your skull. The spinal cord of an ape exits Kind of at the back of the skull. It's not at the it's not at the base. It's at the back. So it's not. I see that here. It's farther back. And we carry a lot since we don't walk on our knuckles. We carry a lot of our weight on these lower limbs, and that morphology of those lower limbs has changed to reflect that. If you look, if you were to compare, especially like our pelvic girdle, our pelvic girdle has changed markedly from those of. The great eggs from when we diverged, our lineages diverged um, millions of years ago. So, pretty cool. So, those are the big, the big differences in that bi bipedal, um, related to bipedal locomotion. Where the spinal cord um, exits the bottom of the skull, the presence or absence of curvature in the spine, and essentially lower extremity morphology, and particularly pelvic girdle morphology. So your book has like a pretty long section about this. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this um, because if you're really interested in the evolution of, um, well, anthropology is more like human culture, but it's just going to give you like a quick tour of human evolution. So um, early hominoids, there were hundreds, hundreds of thousands of years ago, up to millions of years ago, millions of years ago, 
you had multiple genera of hominids. We don't today. There's only one extant genus, and that's Homo. Um, so genus Homo, at one time, there were three to seven species. And that just depends on who's counting that. Actually, it depends on the paleontologist and anthropologist. Um, and then... And then um, you have genus Australopithecus, which is another hominid. There were seven species of these. They were smaller animals, um, smaller hominids. Uh, you may have heard of like Lucy. If you've ever heard of the uh, like Lucy, you should look her up. Lucy is an Australopithecus um, fossilized bones we found. So we found. We have lots of evidence. We found these organisms, and we know that they're part of our lineage um, for a good number of reasons. And we act there actually are some older lineages of hominids, but the ones that you hear the most about are Homo, genus Homo, and genus Australopithecus. And yeah, genus Homo used to have like a Homo heidelbergensis, Homo neanderthalensis. Uh, there's another one that comes right off, not besides Homo sapiens. Um, there's several, several, several. But you've probably heard of Homo neanderthalensis because those are the Neanderthals, and that was a, that is a um, species of, of human-like hominids that there are modern humans today and species Homo sapiens that actually carry evidence of past crosses of Homo neanderthalensis with Homo sapiens, which is pretty cool. All right. Um, Yes, and so in every in every case where fossils allow determination, these are bipedal hominids. Okay, that's a hallmark. And um, as you had, you know, I think the the first modern humans, you have evidence for those around six hundred thousand years ago. And this is actually these are cave paintings, I believe, from France, um, that were found in, where you had uh, the first what we call cro magnon man which was Homo sapiens. So you had Homo neanderthalensis, and then those Homo neanderthalensis was, was dominant for a long time based on the fossil record um, and, and paleontology. And then you had essentially the disappearance. Neanderthalensis essentially just like disappeared. I think it was somewhere around like 30, 34,000 years ago, just like was out, just peaked. Um, and you have Cro-Magnon man, modern humans that supplanted them. And all of the other species of hominids have died out, of course. So the last thing your book talks about, the last thing I'll talk about is um, people often like gr grouping humans in terms of like races. Um, so, and I think this is kind of cool, I guess. So, uh, yeah, it is cool. So human beings, as we have spread, we've changed. There's there are obviously phenotypic differences in humans. I mean, look at it, right? I mean, um, but obviously, and I mean, I don't have to tell people this now. This was a thing you actually had to tell people, I'm sure, uh, some time ago. But humans are obviously all the same species. Homo sapiens are the same species. We all can mate with one another. We can reach for offspring. We could mate. Even, you know, in the past, there is evidence that Neanderthals and, pro and modern humans also mated, but we know humans can mate all together. We all have same species, right? But we group humans. People have historically grouped humans based on visual cues and not based on actual similarities that have any grounding in real science. Um, because there are no there are no subspecies of humans. This is another thing I don't feel like I have to tell you know students in a class today. But um, the reason I'm telling you this is it's it's what's cool is even though we have folks are kind of divided up in terms of you say oh well we have human races yeah I mean visually speaking you could say that um, but if you look at things like it's like blood group types, certain genetic loci that would be more important in terms of similarity than, say, you know, whether you have darker skin color versus a lighter skin color. You actually see a much different picture 
of the human race when you group people by uh, genetic loci that actually matter in terms of similarity, like actual genetic similarity. Skin color is a, oh, my, my battery's going to die. Skin color is a, not a great, um, not a great indicator of genetic similarity. As you might know from just looking at people in the same family who are literally genetically related. I mean, um, I'm trying to find my battery because I want to keep talking about this. Thanks for sticking with me, guys. We're almost there. Yeah. Yeah. Could you take her outside so I can finish this lecture? Yes. If you'll take her out to finish. If you'll take her out so I can finish. Okay. So, like, even if you look at, like, for example, um, you know, I could show you a picture of my kid. And who is, like, look at him, right? And then I show you my nephews who are very genetically similar and they have darker skin color. Right, even though they're very genetically related. So, um, my husband, everyone is suddenly wanting to come in. So I guess I have to finish. Right. So, this is a cool. This is the whole point of this end of your book. It's kind of like a kumbaya ending to the semester. It's like we're really all so related, which is true. I mean, we are. Um, but I love this map, which is showing you if we were to group humans based on genetic similarity versus skin pigmentation and you see a very different picture right so if you have similar a similar pigment in the map then it means you have similarities and if you look really closely here right most of the you know parts of here of the of, of arab states and europe all very 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 closely genetic related right in the United States, North America, up through um, genetic similarity. Most, the ma majority of people are most genetically similar to folks on this side of the planet. Pretty cool, right? But I love uh, Europe, and this is, it's poetic to me, because like European colonization of other parts of the world and European subjugation of other people has no basis in genetic similarity. Like, you're, that's, those are your relatives. Yikes, right? Big yikes. Why'd you do that? Um, whereas if you just look at skin pigmentation, yeah, there's a lot of differences because there's differences in the amount of UV solar radiation, right? That affects your phenotype, right? I don't produce any melanin. Save me, I'm going to die of skin cancer, right? Because my people were from um, the, actually my people were from the up here so um so we're very light skinned but genetically and this is like this is talking more like in indigenous groups um genetically though we are more similar to folks in you know in africa anyway so um that isn't to say there is no such thing as races there is not a biological but the whole point of your book is saying is there's not a biological basis for humans dividing each other based upon um, visual cues, such as skin color, um, things that we think of as races that you would mark on a box, right? Um, and like I said, that's not to say, and that's not to say there are no such thing as races. There's just not a biological basis for dividing humans by skin color. There is, of course, you know, there are cultural and psycho, well, psychological, but also cultural aspects of that that we don't talk about in this class about, like, Yes, of course, there are different races because people have been treated differently based on these visual cues, and that's a big thing. And there's this whole, well, it's a whole, there's multiple classes you could take on that. There's so many books that you want to, I could tell you some great books to read um, about like that kind of stuff, about, um, you know, racism and how humans have, you know, especially um, European white colonial settlers have you know, change the world essentially based on visual cues. Um, but biologically speaking, we're actually, <laughs> people with different skin colors are actually more closely related than some folks who may have a very similar skin color, which I think is cool. Anyway, okay. So thanks for coming to my TED Talk. Um, <laughs> I love it. Such vast diversity, even in the human species. Beautiful, it's so beautiful, right? Okay, so um, that's it.
that's all. I'm trying to think if there's anything that I need to to point out in particular. Um, but you know, please read in your book about this because I get real excited. I'm like, where? Um, but do read in your book, especially about this. Like, you know, can you say that human humans are, um, you know, can you group them differently based on skin color? Well, not biologically. I mean, no. Obviously, yes, in terms of, like I said, anthropo anthropologically, um, yes, that's the thing that's been done, right? And there's been a whole series of, of, gosh, lines of, whole disciplines of study that have come out of it, right? And whole systems of, of human culture and pol politics and all that kind of stuff, um, but biologically speaking, no. So, all right. Uh, that's the last lecture. Wow. Okay, we're done. What do I do now? Research. Yeah. That's what I'm doing. So, um, you have questions. So, be sure. Please read your book. Please read your book. Read your book. Read it. Okay. Because it provides, it basically like supports this and says things in a different way. And the, when you hear things in a different way, it helps. So do be sure you do that. Um, and let me know if you have any questions. And I highly suggest in one of our Schoology updates, I put a code to end instructions for getting into the tutoring group that Hannah Zhang is still running. She's still doing it. Um, I think she was like on TV for it, which is awesome. Join that group and she will help you. Okay, she actually does practice tests and all sorts of stuff. So she's a very good resource. The last thing I'll say that I just forgot. Mm. Yep. There's one more thing. Oh, yes. So, um, course evals, you should be getting emails about them. Uh, if if 80% of the class does evals, I'll give everybody a bonus point. If 90% of the class is evals, I'll give everybody two bonus points. No, wait, 